Hey, welcome everyone to the Archicad User Monthly Webinar for January 2021. Uh, I want to introduce you all to my friend John David Rulon. Um, David is an architect who was based in California for a long time, just recently moved to Texas to uh, be with grandchildren. How are you doing, David? Great. Hi, Eric. Nice to talk to you and nice to see you. I think I can. Where at? Where are you right now? Anyway. All right. So you're. I know you've moved the webcams off to the side, so we can see you. And and uh, I want to make okay. sure everyone can see us and can hear us and see the screen right now. We're seeing the image from a couple of nights ago at the Capitol. Um, so please type into the go to webinar questions area. Um, just let us know that you can see us. Tell us where you're calling in from as well. That's always fun. So I see Romrick um, is here. Stuart from Melbourne, Australia. It must be, how early is it? Oh, I guess it's only 8 a.m. there, so it's not too bad. Uh, Dwight, hello. Brett, Nicole from my neighbor in Berkeley, California. Richard in Bermuda. Okay, Paul in Colorado. Sasha from Slovenia. So we're going um, all the way from uh, Eastern Europe to uh, Eastern Australia. Um, Federico from Italy. All right, so um, yeah, feel free to just Say hello um, through the chat area. Um, it's always interesting to see. And uh, uh, but let's uh, start with just how uh, I know David, and uh, you know, just a little bit about his background, and then I'll let David take it away. So David and I have been, you know, talking here and there over the years um, because uh, he's uh, signed up for various things that I offer in terms of master template and training uh, things. Um, and uh, I always wondered what type of work he did. And uh, recently he said, hey, you know, I've been working on this interesting building system, modular building system called QuickBlock, um, and I'd be happy to share that with the uh, Archicad user. He did a, a webinar with Tom Simmons at ArchVista um, and Learn Virtual uh, a couple of months ago. Um, now, it was, I was interested, I didn't know, but you started back at Archicad in the 90s um, at the firm that you, both you and Tom worked at, Escherich, Holmesy Dodge and Davis, um, and you were the one who discovered Archicad as wow, this this looks much better than AutoCAD. Uh, is that right? <laughs> yes, uh, I uh, I had to take a hundred hour course in AutoCAD because we uh, the firm was going to put this gigantic project up in Sacramento um, for the state on the computer, and not many people knew how to use a computer at that time. So we took this course and. I have to say I did not enjoy it at all. It was just, I found it very difficult, needlessly difficult. And then some guy came in off the street with this Archicad program and I sat down and was able to do all kinds of things without any training. Mm -hmm. so I, was, that, uh, was that Jacques Couture? I'm sorry? Was that Jacques Couture? Uh, Jacques, I think was maybe the reseller or not, or Tom, yeah, probably. And then Tom was the CAD supervisor at EHDD. So he was the one kind of in charge of deciding what programs to use and stuff. And so I uh, actually I was able to call, talk him into bringing in one or two sites, I think. And I did a couple projects while I was there on Archicad. Right. Okay. So you go back then to uh, uh, early to mid 90s. Um, and uh, so you've been around the whole thing for a long time. Tell us a little bit about your your firm um, and what pro what types of projects and actually tell us why we're looking at the memorial here. Yeah, uh, well, yesterday I assume probably a lot of you may have watched the inauguration and then the night before, the, which I guess was a a uh, something for Martin Luther Martin Luther King and and then this image, uh, which I was really struck by, uh, and I'm sure many other people were. Uh, it's so beautiful. And it made me think, um, and I, I probably shouldn't get into politics at all, which I won't, but um, I'm so happy right now and feel very um, upbeat and, and optimistic uh, about where we're going right now. And part of it is, uh, I have to say, that the previous administration didn't seem to care too much about art or, or music or all those types of things. And, that last night was just spectacular, I found. Mm -hmm. And so I, um, 
I, as an architect, and I'm sure many, all the other people on the line also feel the same way that we, this architecture is an art and we, uh, we want to celebrate it. And I think we're going to get the chance to do it more so. Mm. So that's the reason for this image. I, I just thought it was so beautiful. Okay. Yeah, it's a timely and and uh, uh, certainly this is a very special moment in time as we transition from one administration to another. And certainly for I share your feeling of relief and optimism that, yeah, there's a lot of really challenging problems. Um, but oh, yeah. we have someone who we have someone who's going to take a fresh approach at it, a very positive approach, inclusive one. And and, uh, you know. But hopefully it'll it'll start working out better. So uh, tell us a little bit about your your yeah. practice over the years. Um, and uh, we're going to be looking at. I'll just give everybody a sneak peek. So we're going to be looking at a very one of your very large um, projects, um, residential. Although it's actually for a company, so it's it's somewhat of a commercial residential um, hybrid. Um, so we'll be looking at that, and then we'll be looking at this building system. Uh, that you've developed that solves a number of issues in terms of uh, the way that buildings are constructed. So it's obviously not going to be the way that all buildings are constructed, but it does solve some specific challenges. And it'll be interesting to see how you've worked through that with Archicad as a, as a working tool. So uh, tell us a little bit about your practice in general, and then we'll go into um, your project. Yeah, I, uh, I've been around for a while. I just, uh, uh, Studied architecture at uh, University of Pennsylvania. I, I first got a, a uh, bachelor's degree in, in in engineering and worked for a couple of years as kind of as an engineer. And then I decided I really liked architecture, but I didn't know if I had any skill at it. And so I took a few courses and and was able. I think I actually uh, applied once to a bunch of schools, didn't get in anywhere. And then applied the next year. Uh, to other schools, and uh, I was able to get into the University of Pennsylvania, and kind of so I went there and totally enjoyed it. Um, at the time, uh, probably most of you are familiar with uh, Louis Kahn. He taught there, but he died in the spring, and I got there in the fall, so I never got a chance to uh, study under him or work with him at all. Uh, but I did have the chance to to both. Uh, study under people that had worked for him and also studied under him. Uh, so I, his work has a very big influence on me. Uh, and I've studied a lot of his work. I know, I knew a, lot of, a number of people that knew, knew very well him. Um, so uh, I, after getting out of school, I worked for why, a man why you know who some of your projects. Just maybe years. So, um, David. While we're while you're talking, bring up some of the slides of your projects, so we're not just sitting on one image here. Okay, sure, yeah. Uh, this this actually is the one we're going to talk about later. Uh, uh, this is a house that is a uh, uh, a large house. I'll, I'll go I'll go over it in a minute, but I, I just made a couple slides here that I'll show based on kind of some of my work, and then um, actually let me go to the. Uh, uh, well, I'll cycle through these as while well I'm talking. Um, uh, so let's see. Okay. So I, I won't say anything about them right now, and we can come back to some of the house, some of the pictures of this house later when we're, we're show, I'm showing the drawings and things. Uh, anyway, so I um, I uh, worked in Philadelphia for. Uh, after getting out of school for about four years, working for a man who I really loved, he was my uh, thesis advisor. And then, uh, uh, then, and he also worked for Khan and studied under Khan. And then uh, I decided to move to California. Uh, I was and moved out here and got a job with a firm in the city that did mostly kind of spec office buildings. And then um, I didn't uh, actually, I was laid off from that company along with the person that laid me off. This was in the early uh, 80s. And then 
uh, worked for myself for a little while, and then re didn't run ran out of money, ran out of work, and went and got was able to get a job with EHDD, the firm that I found out about. Uh, but I was there twice. I went there uh, and then left after a couple of years. Again, tried to work on my own. And in the early 90s, uh, the uh, had another problem with uh, uh, you know, just no work and no, and, and no. And so I went, was able to get back to EHDD, and that's when we did this very large project uh, that, uh, and also where I learned about Archicad for the first time. Um, uh, after I left EHDD. DD and went, actually worked for a firm in Oakland that worked on the um, uh, Graduate Theological Union that Lou Kahn designed in, in Berkeley. Uh, and uh, also worked on a bunch of other projects. I've, I've worked on all different things on, on both schools, universities, large buildings, a um, Mercedes Benz showroom. Oh gosh, all different things. Do you have, do you have images? Just to, we're, it looks like we're staying on this one project. Yeah, so. I'll move on to the next one. Um, so this is this is another. After moving, I moved up to uh, to here up to Rutherford, California, in the late '90s, and uh, worked for a man named uh, Howard Backen, who actually his kind of specialty was modern farmhouses, and so. You'll see a bunch of these modern farmhouses, a lot of which that I did for him, and then uh, ones that I did myself. This is one I did, which was actually a spec house. I did it for the builder. Um, and uh, all of these were done in Archicad, all the ones that I did. Um, the one, that first one that you saw, saw, and then these ones. This is one that was actually a renovation. Uh, of an existing house that we basically gutted the whole house and created new, all new walls inside, a whole new uh, arrangement of how the house uh, was arranged. Um, and, and then the stone was actually there, but it was set there with a, uh, the mortar was set way back in. So I decided to pull it back, back out and make it more wall-like and less individual stones. <laughs> and the new, that was a new thing. Anyway, then this is another house, another kind of this a little less bar, uh, modern farmhouse and more, I don't know what you want to call it. But um, And then uh, one of the big things, I always like to introduce light into the spaces, in, often in the middle of the space with cupolas. And, uh, and then big, especially here in California, you can have big wide porches uh, and open them up. Also, one of the things at Howard Backen's office, where I, I worked there for 10 years from 99 to 2008 or so, and um, we, have the, we have these big pocketed sliding doors that make very big openings. And uh, I, I was, it was, it's a terrific way to go. Uh, this is just another of that same house. Um, and then uh, this is that, that same house. This is, this is in Napa. And you can see the kind of the big, the big opening over here. Uh, that's easier to see. Isn't it? Then this is actually this is a um, I, I had this commission to do a very large house. Uh, unfortunately, it only went as far as design. They decided they couldn't afford it and didn't want to do it. Um, so, but one of the cool things about this was I had a pool that had a glass wall, and then on the well, there's another glass wall on the other side, and there was a an aquarium in here. So the when you're swimming, you could see the fish from inside the pool. And then beyond that, below, there was a wine room. And from the wine room, you had a big window looking in through. I don't know if it was ever going to be possible. but um, And then we have these big uh, doors that uh, pivot. Uh, they pivot down and pivot up to close up the openings. And uh, this is a much more modern house with flat roofs and a cupola above. Um, this is, you can just kind of see it there. Two bedrooms at one end and two bedrooms at the other end, and uh, with they're all en suite, and uh, that's from the other side. There was actually a little, uh, <laughs> it created a little uh, uh, observatory here, and uh, there was a, a hot tub over here, and 
Oh, you can actually, and then there was actually a, a port gochere that the dry, cars could drive underneath. And this was a pool that had fish swimming in it, so you could look up and see the fish as well. Crazy things, but uh, this was a, a very modern house. Actually, uh, this is, was an ADU on a site where the, the main house burned down in the, one of the big Napa fires. And this was done for some two pretty well-known uh, lawyers. And they just recently sold the property to the woman who was taking care of the property. And she is actually going to build this house now. Um, so it's, it's basically a bedroom, a bedroom at each end and uh, uh, a kind of a great room in the, in the middle and then uh, outdoor spaces at each end. Again, because of the way, we, uh, way it is in, in the Napa Valley, you really can live outside a lot. So, and this had these big, I think these were actually, uh, these were uh, swing doors, I guess they're. So, um, so you have some, you have some uh, cutouts in the terrain in the background. Um, are, are they like where an existing oh, okay. building was? Yeah, that was, that was where the original house was that burned down. And this was a pool. Mm. And that was, I guess, a terrace or something, I can't remember. Um, okay, cool. All right. So, let's see. Okay. Are we ready to take a look at uh, your yeah project? yeah yeah so uh, so I'll just give you all a little uh, you know tiny bit of additional background so when David first you know said hey Eric you know I have something I'd love to share with the user group um, I mentioned quick blocks and you know he showed me some things with it and I thought yeah this is interesting but um, it's definitely not what um, the majority of our CAD users could even use because it's in fact the building system is in development and I asked it well do you have a project or two that you know shows your design that you're really you know think came out well it said oh absolutely sure I can let me bring up this one and I went and looked at it and said oh this is gonna be perfect let's let's uh, you know have you focus on that and then yeah. building system afterward um, because this everybody can relate to I mean even though you know, everybody works on different styles and sizes of projects, but uh, this is a traditional Archicad project in that it is a design going all the way through construction drawings and, um, you know, in this case, a, a fairly large um, scope. So uh, take us through it. Okay. Actually, let me go back for one second to that other thing. Was, oh, no. Where is it? Uh, did I lose it? Uh, well, anyway, okay. Uh, I, I, some great uh, feedback. People, people saying excellent work, excellent projects, and love the love the turret. <laughs> you know. <so. laughs> well, that, that's a again a Lucan kind of thing. Uh, well, I'll go. I'll go through it a little bit. Uh, this was a project that I um, I lived in. I lived in Rutherford, California, and this project is in Rutherford. It was done for a uh, uh, a wine company called One Hope Wines. Uh, they're they bought the property uh, with a design for a winery, and the design for the winery was actually done by my old boss, Howard Backen. Uh, but they didn't want to do the winery first. They wanted to build this, this house first. And uh, so, uh, and they had, they given me a program. So that's what I was just looking for right now. Let's see, let's see real fast if I can find it. Um, yeah. Um, so they they actually wrote out a pretty long program. It was turned out, and then I you can see the green, and this is the first question they said, "What excites about the project?" And uh, and so I really wanted to get this job, so I you know, really spent some time uh, answering all of their questions. And there were well, it turned out to be eight pages of questions and answers. And uh, and uh, so. Uh, when I was one of probably 25 people, that 25 architects they were looking at to begin with, and then uh, they narrowed it down to five, and I was still in the group, and I thought, wow, this is amazing, because uh, I'm just a single practitioner. I don't work, I don't have other people working for me. And then they narrowed it down to three, and I was one, and the other two, one was a mid-sized ar architectural firm in the city, uh, pretty well known. And then a, a third one was a, 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 that had offices all around the country. And I thought, wow, this is there's no way I'm going to get this, uh, but I did. <laughs> and you know, I guess there's a number of reasons why. Part, partly because I 
when I first heard about it and talked to the CEO of the company, he told me where the property was, and I just got on my bike and rode over there. And uh, it may have been helped to set the deal. I don't know. Anyway, so this uh, this is uh, a 3D image that is uh, I created over time. Uh, but uh, as I was going to say, also in that that program, I said they had asked me the schedule and. Actually, I, I went. I found this whole thing, which I wrote back in 2014, and I actually came close to meeting the deadlines that they had asked me for. Starting out with getting the, um, getting kind of an initial design done in about two to three months. Uh, now, obviously, it was just a ton of details and things that were done. Uh, I'm going to go to the. I'm going to go to the uh, here now. Uh, this is this was the title sheet for the for the. Um, drawing as you can see this this is a list of drawings here and this doesn't even include all of the details and uh, things that came up during construction and everything uh, but um, let's see I got I have kind of made a list of the drawings I might go through and then I'll show you the, the site plan which is uh, nine. so by the and, way the, that three, that 3d view that we were seeing had these sort of gray forms in the front. Are those uh, sort of a quick representation of uh, the, the vines, the wine growing? Yeah, these are the vines. Those are the vines. That's the exist that was the winery that hadn't yet been built. Mm -hmm. They had a design for it, uh, but they wanted to build, and this, it was just a, what they call a use permit at the time, uh, which you have to do with in Napa County. Uh, and, uh, but it was enough there to kind of give them a sense of what the, what the winery was going to look like. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you can see these are the vines, and and I put, you know, I had I had a whole group. But there was landscape architect, interior the interior designer. Actually, was a woman who worked for One, One Hope Company. It turns out then she married the CEO, and they had they had their wedding here at this in, in 2018, in August of 2018. Um, so. Um, uh, this is a this is a site plan. I and as you can see, I, I had a whole whole bunch of drawings in here, uh, but I was able to create this whole thing in Archicad by myself, pretty much. And and uh, and I would do uh, 3D meetings with them if they can't, if I couldn't meet with them in person, uh, with uh, you know like like we're doing now. And uh, so you can see that this this is the site. Uh, this this is uh, what they call Highway 29, which runs up through the Napa Valley. I used to live about a about a half mile or mile away. To can the you north. zoom in? Can you zoom in a little bit on the actual sure. drawing? Yeah, I have to get used to the. Okay, so now now we can see uh, the the main building, and then of course the neighboring buildings and and the the wine, the rows of wine uh, right. grapes. Uh, and then uh, let's see. That's, that's, that's just the first floor plan. Well, here's a partial site plan that gets a little closer. Um, and all of this stuff. I mean, the, the county was really particular about what you had to provide to them, which was a lot. Um, then this was the first. This is the first floor plan of that I had because it was so big, and I could only fit it on. I could only uh, use such. Uh, I think it was. 30 by 42 inch sheets. Uh, so you had to, I couldn't fit everything on the sh sheet of, in one floor plan. So I actually broke it up into two, two halves of the building. Uh, but this is the, this is the one that has everything on it. This is the first floor plan. And so you would end, you would enter here. Uh, there's a front porch here, which you probably see, and then a front entry here. And then you come in and then you can, this is a great room here with a big covered porch on this side and a smaller covered porch here, and then two uh, rooms that were building, or rooms that came off of, because they would have meetings in and they wanted to have places you can come out and meet in smaller offices. And then the, the two, there's two wings of bedrooms, so one on one side and one on the other. These are two stories. Uh, basically, the bedrooms are stacked on top of each other with the bathrooms and, and then they're on the ground floor each one had a little outdoor um, uh, enclosed gardens and then 
uh, then out over here, there was a, an outdoor dining area that was covered with uh, this stuff called woven willow, which uh, was pretty cool. And um, and then there was what we called the barn, or the, the car barn, which was really a place where caterers could come and set up their catering. And then they could come in and there, there's a big pantry here, two powder rooms here. Uh, 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 I forget what. Oh, this is this. This is the can you zoom, housekeeping. Zoom in. Monthly. Zoom in again on this. Sorry, go ahead. David, can you zoom in again on this? People are asking because it's really hard. Uh, you know, you're not using the screen as well as you could. I know you you have some issues with your mouse and and the zoom, but you um, you, you can start by just doing a fit in window. <clears throat> um, okay. And that that will by itself will just help. Um, and, uh, zoom in more, or is that well? Good? I mean, that's that's better. Uh, okay. All right, I'm sorry. Just yeah, please interrupt whenever I, if I'm doing something. That's good. Uh, this is my only only my second webinar, so you have to bear with me a little bit. Um, there's a, this was a garden, uh, an entry garden here, and this was a place where you could come in and park. We had uh, places. Well, actually, we had places out here too. Uh, for parking for and places you could charge your cars your electric cars and this was kind of back of the house things this is for trash over here and this was all mechanical equipment and uh and then a big pool here that had a um uh, a spa area at the end and there's actually there were uh, there's like what they call a baja ledge with with steps coming down so you could put your chair in the water here and then swim in here and then they actually put out, they had a pizza oven over here. And they have a whole bunch of gardens over here that they, because they had to have places for their septic areas that were buried under the ground. Um, so that was, uh, this, this, this was, well, that's one, one, one half the first, well, one half of the uh, first floor plan. And um, this is the other half. Uh, oh, no, that's, that's a slab plan. Uh, that's the other half. This was the tower that was um, that you saw in there. Someone I think may have mentioned it. It's a um, it's a tower that you enter here, and actually in this little small square area. Is that can you see it big enough? Yes, uh, we, we can see it well enough. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's a wine room in there, and this is all you'll actually see some images of that. And you could then go, you take a stair that wraps around that wine room and takes you up to the second level. And then at the next level up, uh, which I don't know if I uh, have it here, you get into a spiral stair that takes you all the way up to the top level. And then there's some two things. This was this was a. Uh, at first, I didn't think I would sell them on this whole idea because it's a pretty expensive thing to do. But uh, the host, the uh, the uh, the CEO loved the idea of it and. Uh, and so we were able to convince them to do it. And I was so happy it was able to oh, I'm trying to get to work. Anyway, uh, let me go back to my list here. So, so, mm -hmm. for, uh, that, so then uh, one of the things you have to do, and probably a lot of people have to can you, uh, David, David, can you just use back to 3D? You know, we've been oh, yeah. seeing 2D for a while. Uh, yeah. and, um, and just to go around it now that we've gotten a little bit acquainted, get a little bit closer. And just point point out some of the landmarks. Obviously, we can see the the tower there. Okay, so you come in. Um, let me back up a little bit. I'm sorry, I got to keep putting the mouse the wrong way. Come in a long driveway. Uh, there's a couple pullouts, and then these are all vineyards. These are all vines. And actually, just replanted this set of vines. That's the winery over there that is now finished and built. And this was the house. And then there's another house uh, that on a separate property back here, uh, but they shared they shared this driveway that went all the way back. And um, I'll zoom in now. Um, after, so um, This is the entryway. There's a ramp, ramped entryway. You come up onto a porch here, 
and then come in. That's the uh, front door, which is a, a steel and glass door. And, uh, and then the left, that's, on the left, that's on the left of the screen. I was wondering, I couldn't quite see. All right. <clears throat> so near near the tower. You wanted me to move over there? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I just was. I was unclear what you when you were saying. This is the entryway. I couldn't see where you were pointing. I should. I can. If it's okay, I'll turn off the trees so they don't get in the way. Yeah. That that might be good. Why can't? I? You're still in. You might still be in orbit mode or something. I don't know. Yeah. Um, Okay, that better? Yeah, that that makes it much easier. <clears throat> okay, so this 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 is the entry here. It's a covered porch. Actually, people even hang out here and hang out over here. The nice thing about this house is that it has places all around, inside and outside, where people can sit. And, and then these are these two rooms. This was this room over here is what they call the man cave, and it's a uh, has a fireplace, has a, has some uh, dispensers for wine and beer, and a TV above the fireplace, and it's uh, and it's all uh, it's all dark paneling and dark paneling on the roof. And then, um, so if I let me see if I can move into the house, um, we come in here, and that's the hallway down to the to the um, bedrooms there to the wing on the south side. And um, I guess I have to come through here. Um, by the way, what, what is your hardware setup? Uh, I, I think people are uh, curious, you know, in terms of having a project as large as this and, you know, being able to maneuver yeah. around it. I have, it's, um, It's a Mac. It's a Macintosh. It's an old Mac. It was I built it, bought it in let's see, 2014. I've got a lot of RAM, um, but uh, I do need to get an upgrade. I really do. I, um, I'm now using 24. This is and I changed converted this to 24, but um, this is really pushing it. I think, uh, and you can actually see this little glass. This is a little glass thing that you can see on all four sides of the that when you can look in and see actually see the bottles in there and look into the wine room. And actually this there's a wall here which we put holes in it to put put us put there were eight bottles of wine that we gave to the for the eight bedrooms. When people came, they could pick up their bottle of wine and take it to the room. Mm -hmm. so, okay. So um what, what I want to uh, start to jump to, you've, you've shown us a, a lot about, you know, the architectural program and where things are. Um, one of the things that I always like bringing up is, you know, there's certain details that uh, we wonder how you did it. So stop right there. How are you yeah. doing the trust structures? Um, I started out, um, the trust is, well, I should give a shout out to, um, uh, what's his name? Um, in Arkansas, Faye, Faye Jones, who did an absolutely spectacular church called Thorn Crown Chapel that had the, every every connection like the one you see here with this hole was a, a little piece of steel that you could see through. And I thought, God, that's a great thing. I should have did that. I did this on a previous project, but uh, because the icon of the of the One Hope is, is a round circle, uh, I introduced the circles in a lot of places. You can see those circular windows at the ends at, at each end. Uh, but I, what this is, is I simply used, a, a created it with, a, with a slab tool, uh, each, each one of these beams. And then, then uh, I made the, the, actually these even have the metal connectors inside and this metal connector. So I made it into a, eventually into a library part. That I could then so you you created it with a slab tool and, uh, lying down on the on the floor on the floor then yeah library part that gets flipped up into its uh, actual orientation okay Correct. yes all right and those were custom basically you just took the uh, the line work or you figured out what the shape it had to have and drew it on the plan 
in with the yeah, staff. actually it was uh, the structural engineer was involved and he helped me this I kind of came up with the shape of the truss but he told me what to do with for the connections involved which all those are actually done correctly in terms of structural engineering too right so okay what you see is what you get right now um, you have a bunch of siding or board work showing and I yeah. just want to find out is that just purely um, a surface texture yes it is okay so by the so, way you can which um, maybe switch out of um, your orbit mode so you can select things um, and then uh, you know select the wall and let's just see what the settings are of the, uh, that wall okay so you've got a, a, com a composite wall so it's just basically uniform from top to bottom and your surfaces say ceiling white or siding that's on the outside this is on the inside. vertical siding so that's just basically the line work is just showing from that surface okay and yeah. I'm assuming that your underside of your uh, roofs your cathedral ceiling sort of thing um, that's them in a similar way similar yeah okay all right that's fine now can you uh, go back out to the outside because I uh, wanted to ask you about um, the uh, standing seam roof and I wanted to ask you also about um, the uh, board and batten or what looks in some parts like board and batten um, yeah, uh, let's see. These, um, I think, I'm trying to remember this. Yeah, this is board and batten. Uh, there's vertical board and batten and horizontal board boards. Um, now, I'm not seeing all the detail that right now we're just seeing lines, but I, I thought earlier I was seeing some uh, boards. Yeah, let me just see. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, let me pull up the photo. Yeah, um, I think I did. I think I thought I did create it so you would see the boards, but it's all done with lines and not. Uh, all right. So right right now you're uh, let's say this model just has lines where those boards are, and uh, as opposed to showing the boards. Now your standing yeah. seam. Um, uh, so is that just also line work? So these are just simple surfaces. Um, I think this is uh, this is one of one of yours, I think. Uh, or let's see whether uh, I have to just do a shout out to you, Eric. You you created a lot of makes things so much easier in so many ways. But I wish I took took advantage more so of what you do. Uh, I, because I'm a lone sh lone person, I often don't have time to go and uh, try to learn all this stuff. Oh, um, so you're you're selecting the roof, and we can just see that. There's a, a, a surface texture that says standing seam, so it's it doesn't really have the bump up. It's not looking, um, you know, it's not showing the detail of it. No, uh, but it certainly communicates it well enough. Um, but uh, you may want to check out uh, the uh, David um, the December webinar, the one I did a month ago, uh, where I showed using the curtain wall tool. It's, there are different ways that you can do standing seam and board and batten. Um, uh, but one thing that I've recently gotten sort of fascinated with is how you can use the curtain wall tool to create ribs, you know, for standing seam, um, and you can use it for board and batten. And it's uh, because it's a system tool, you can basically say it's every so many inches or whatever distance from one to the next, and you create the dimension of it. And you can have this, <laughs> the surfaces on the edge of a wall, you know, going vertically, and you can also have it on the face of a roof going on whatever angle it has to be and cut it out in a polygon so that it basically fits the roof shape. Um, and I did some additional experimentation since then to figure out the best ways to cut out holes for doors and windows because you know the curtain wall or the system at first will just go across the whole face. Anyway, so this is how, as far as you took the model, you're getting clean results and obviously you know it's a fascinating design how did you do the fencing, um, the little railing stuff um, there in the... Uh, uh, Those are actually, uh, like, I think they're little col thin columns and thin beams. Okay. Yeah. All right. So they're columns or beams, each one being um, very small. And are they, um, are they round or square? Um, they're square. They're square. Okay. So you're doing them as square because, you know, it's good enough from for this size 
to yeah that. and actually uh, that, that's a it's a woven wire thing and i and when i get i have a lot of details that you know you get into it but i'll do that all in 2d i don't try to model it um i mean i i understand uh, that a lot of people like to model it all the way in and not have to do uh, i i just found it easier to maybe because i'm too old to figure it out uh, mm -hmm. but um i prefer to actually work in 2d often when i get down into the detail but i was going to just say this interesting thing here let me just open this one up i i think i yeah i i took a picture of some barn material and pasted that into the become the so you see that on the side of the side you know the surfaces Mm -hmm. uh, by the way, we've uh, had a couple of people ask, how are you doing with um, the Big Sur operating system? So this is the most recent Apple system. It came out in whatever, October or something. Um, you're on Big Sur? Yes, I am. Um, so far, it's been okay. Um, I did have a couple crashes, and, uh, and but so far, uh, I'm okay. So mm -hmm. I haven't been too bad. Uh, I always reluctant to especially when i'm in a project i don't try not to convert it leave it to where it was um uh actually here i am so um ian says what was the original arcad version of this model would it be easier in arcad 24 so you did this model back in 2014 2014 uh, yeah so that would be seven years ago now so i think it was 20 or 19 i'm not sure Okay, well, if you had started it in 2014, that would be seven years ago, and you'd be, and Arcad was version 17 at the time. Um, okay. I know when we first talked, you had it in 20, so that must have been the last time you were working on it, and then you took it into 24 because I said, hey, you might as well have a current version, even if you're not working on it. That way, it'll be easy to open um, uh, with the current tools. So the question in terms of Ian, uh, Ian's question is, uh, would it be easier in Arcad 24? Um, well, in, in general terms, I think Arcad has more capabilities, so there are going to be some things that you can do now that you couldn't do before, or some things that are done in fewer steps, or you know, there's systems to do it. Um, so I think... One, it, one, thing I, one thing that 24 has, I don't think I had before that, was this twin motion uh, rendering engine, which is amazing, I find. And it's, I've done a bunch of renderings now of things that, um, and little videos and stuff I thought was really cool. They're really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very true. Um, so yeah, you can do your regular work the same, but you can do twin motion, which you couldn't before. That would be one example. Um, that, that is where, where I definitely need more horsepower. My computer just, uh, it was crashing often and i yeah. couldn't i couldn't bring sounds in that we're supposed to be able to do so i don't know i'm sure it's so um, more horsepower helps and of course archicad over the years has gotten able gotten more capable of handling larger projects and in general will refresh certain things faster or it'll refresh things in the background rather than having uh, when you click on an elevation uh you know it, it, to update it it may already have some things pre-computed um, so uh, I don't see any features here that you're using that would require or would definitely benefit from 24. Uh, as I said, you could get more detail, you know, on the cladding of the, the board and batten and, and the um, uh, roof surface, either using, well, variety of tools. I mentioned the curtain wall. Uh, one of the other people here, Lawrence Brill, who's based in Australia, uh, points out that CAD image uh, which is a New Zealand-based um, company that makes add-ons for ARCAD. They have something, I think it's called Surfacer, um, uh, but it might be CAD image cladding, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, they have a tool that basically you say, hey, put this type of system on these roofs. And you define, of course, some parameters for the system, and it will create something that sits next to the roof and mates with the roof, in a sense, um, and uh, gives you the you know standing seam, for example, or board and batten. Um, and uh, it is a powerful tool. You know they do charge because they've put in a lot of effort to create it. 
Um, and I think it used to be you just buy it and then you'd have it for as long as you wanted. Now I think you may have to do subscription. So, um, you know, that's always some trade off. Uh, do you want to, is it worth spending that money to have it? Um, but I've been fascinated with the curtain wall tool, as I mentioned, um, which has gotten a lot better in recent years. So I think wh wh whatever year it was, whether it was 21, Arcad 21 or something, you know, the curtain wall tool was dramatically improved compared to previous ones. Um, so, all right, um, let's see, other questions. I think we, we wanna at some point in relatively near future um, take a start looking at your quick block system, but let's do take some um, sections. Let's take a look at some sections. Yeah. Okay. This, by the way, was, uh, yeah, I created a whole area plan I, I'm not sure why they're missing all the, the like the spreadsheet and stuff. But anyway, uh, all these things that Archicad can do, it's just so great. Um, uh, D23. So I, as you can see on this over here, I have whatever, like, let's see, including structural. And, and on this is this is our 86 sheets, or no, uh, 82 sheets. 83 sheets, um, just architectural for this project. So, and then I got the whole thing of structural, uh, you know, it's like, let's see, 13 sheets of structural, a bunch of sheets for civil, a bunch of sheets for landscape, a bunch of mechanical, plumbing, electrical, lighting, and then all these, what's called, I call it ASKs, which are architectural sketches. And so, it was a very large, I don't know, it's all, it's over maybe one and a half gigabytes or something, the whole thing, but mm -hmm. I was able to handle it. I was amazed. I never I couldn't believe it. Um, let's see. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll show you a couple sections first and then zoom into the details and things. Mm -hmm. um, well, first, uh, this is uh, the this is building section. Oops. All right. These are, uh, and you can see all uh, up here where all the sections are taken, both sections and elevations. Uh, well, this, this just shows sections, the other ones are, or no, they show elevations too. Um, so this is a section through the great room, through the uh, porch towards the front and the porch in the back, and then the bedrooms back here. Uh, this is a hallway that serves the bedrooms, and there's a stair in the middle here that takes you up to the second floor, so there's a bedroom on one end. And one be a bedroom on this end, and same down here. Uh, and then uh, this is the south wing, and then the north wing is actually this wing here. And so this is looking looking towards the south, and this is looking towards the north. Uh, and the in the in this great room, there's actually two kitchens. There's a back-to-back -back kitchen. One is for the, the people staying here, and then the others on the other side meant for like catering and people. They they, they have a, a a, uh, a whole well, the, the car barn and also a big pantry area that they can set up for. You know. so David, can you open up the source view of, of one of those sections so we can sure. then zoom in? Um, on, on it? Uh, by the way, this is a trellis here that we're growing vines up on. Uh, mm. They're only up to about here right now so far. Um, So I'm always interested in seeing how far models have, got, have been taken compared to, you know, the 2D line work. So yeah. that's that's why I want to zoom Probably in. Probably not as good as most of your, most of your users. But try so to zoom, zoom in on where the, you know, some roofs meet walls. Um, now, well, I have wall sections that kind of really detail it. Yeah. So that's that's what I want to see is how far did you take it in this? And then you have a wall section that, of course, uh, you know, goes further. All right. So um, uh, you were, t we were. I asked you this in our brief meeting before a few days ago. So the uh, roof insulation um, is, uh, you said, sprayed on. Sprayed on, yeah. Foam. Yes. That's why you've got the uh, the different symbol than the than the soft insulation for the walls. Correct. Okay. Um, and uh, so what what here is 2D? Anything here in 2D? Uh, 2D, 
maybe, yeah, these guys, I guess. Is this, uh, what is this? That says it's a roof, so that's actually 3D. Okay. Um, so uh, if you want to just go, go to the line tool and do Command A, just click the line tool and do Command A. Let me back up a little bit. Huh? So command uh -huh. so yeah I did no, let me try again. All right, so maybe you have nothing you have um hold on no I'm sure I've got something. No? I don't have anything. All right, so maybe you have no line work there. Okay, that that's no. interesting. All right, so let's let's take a look at a wall section that at least it relates to uh this type of condition and say yeah. see what you've got. Let me go back to the uh section see if i pull up one okay on a 56. so actually before you do that open up that source view let's just see if you're linked here so right click on that and say open up the source view uh, i have to be in the source I... no you want to open up the the section source view yeah okay And then in the source view, yeah. select the actual marker, the one, you know, the 56, whatever we were saying, right. and say, open that view. Uh, here, you'll, I think I basically drew everything on one set of details. Uh, I think uh, only I'll look and see. Only open that. All right, well, if you right click and you say um, detail selection settings, open with current view settings. I found it easier because I could then see how things related to other things. Well, okay, we're still not seeing it. So can you right click on that? Up, it, as I say, my computer is a little slow. Oh, it, uh, the, it's, doesn't look like it. it's a 2D drawing, so it should come up uh, instantly. So you right well, you know, except it's not just that. Uh, you'll see in a second once it gets up here. It's uh, It's probably, Almost all of this, all of the wall sections of the whole house. You have all the wall sections to put together in like a worksheet? Yeah. Okay. Um, Probably not the best way to do it, but. That's well, okay, it's still, you think it's actually computing? I don't think so. Can you right click on it and. and uh, it's, it's the thing spinning. Let me oh, just you've see got it spinning. Okay, so you, we, we don't see the spinning thing. Um, okay. Um, What's going on? I hope I crash. <laughs> okay, uh, it happens to the best of us. Um, all right, let's see if there are any questions. Oh, there, uh, there it is. It just came up. Oh, okay. All right, good. So uh, we are now looking at. Well, waiting for it to fill in. I can zoom in. I'm not sure where that section is. But, all right. Well, uh, let's just zoom in on one of the sections with uh, and show the so I, I see the sheet on it. But um, yeah, yeah, go on. Okay, so, you so can see there's a bunch of things over here, which are the tower. This is all tower stuff related stuff. These are, I think this is the great room here. Okay, zoom in on one of those areas um, if you could. Yeah, it's right now it's still spinning. It's still spinning. Okay. All right. So we can see obviously it's a lot of data here. You know, it's a lot of different pieces of the model that are coming up. Um, clearly, they're not um, live because we're they're not arrayed like that in the real model. Um, but it is interesting that it's taking that long just to bring up a 2D drawing um, and uh, bogging your computer down. Um, so, but what I do like, and I can understand your, why you're doing it, is uh, you know, you've got all of these different related wall sections that you can then copy and paste 2D information from one to another. And, exactly. you, can, and you can see the different, Slightly different context or the slightly different, um, uh, you know, building elements in there. So hopefully we get to see this. So um, I want to invite questions or comments. So I do see Steve Nichols is all extremely interesting. Hope you got paid well um, here. Um, I it, yeah, I was. A, it was. It was a absolutely lovely clients. I, I totally enjoyed them. I'm still. Friend, I'm actually doing a house for the CEO and his wife. It's a remodel of a little house in Napa, 
and uh, they they um, they do all these wonderful things where they have events for good causes. And, you, and I, if anybody wants to buy wine, you should buy it from One Hook because the, the part of the part of the money goes towards uh, good things. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to do a shout out here. I see David Nicholson Cole is on the line. He says thank you for organizing this webinar. Um, for those of you who don't know, David Nicholson Cole is very long time Arcad user. He's written a book called um, uh, G the GDL Cookbook. Uh, in, in the 90s, it was one of the Bibles that people like me would go to to understand the uh, programming language behind Archicad. Um, he teaches or used to teach, I'm not sure whether he still is, in uh, Nottingham, I think, in, in the UK. Um, David, glad you could make it. And I'd like to talk to you sometime. I'll, I'll drop you an email. Hopefully, I still have your email in there. Um, and uh, maybe, maybe you can be, uh, David, you can be a guest uh, one of these times. Um, so this question from Doug Muir, could John reveal duration of schedule, building costs and fees? Yeah, um, that thing I showed you with, it, with the program, I, I did actually, as I said, it was like eight pages. And one of them was, was budget and one was uh, the timing of things. And, Timing actually came out probably within a year of what the final construction was, and some of it was was out of my hands. But uh, uh, budget was they had a very unrealistic budget to begin with, which often clients do. Uh, but I always recommended, and I don't know if other people do this, but I, I, this is something I learned from Howard Backen was that to get a contractor involved early on and get them to help come up with budgets and things because uh, mine are just, I, I wouldn't trust myself. And that way you at least get a sense of what, approximately what it's gonna cost early on so you don't go through a whole set of drawings like this with 86 sheets and then find out you're $10 million over. This, this budget, when they first came to me, they were talking about two and a half million dollars, which I knew was it was way low, but I didn't know how low. And also they added things and, so I ended up, I think the whole thing, including the landscape and uh, all the infrastructure and stuff was around 10 million, um, somewhere in that range. Um, uh, but, you know, it was, it was a lovely, wonderful project to work on. I worked on it for almost three years. Um, but the initial submission to the county for a building permit I had it, uh, it was, we submit, we, I started in October, or got the job in October, November of 2014. Um, we submitted in July of 2015. We came out of, you know, with permits having gone through a bunch of, you know, comments and revi revisions and things. It eventually came out in, the, I think, just October, no, December, November or December of 2015, and they started right away on construction. Okay. It was finished in 2018. Uh, All right. Well, um, I think uh, you've given us an eyeful, so to speak, uh, uh, here. Um, uh, there are a couple of comments about putting the all of these on a worksheet. Steve Pribbles is what are the advantages of such a worksheet, and Ian Reed says. Detail sections on one sheet. We all do this sometimes, don't we? Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I think that's um, one of the options that you can do. Um, in terms of challenge, let me just see if I can find one of the ones which was. Oh, actually, that no, wasn't that. Let me just see, uh, which was really pretty cool. Uh, A50. Um, one of the ones at the tower. Uh, so I got, you know, I got all the stuff on the tower, and then there are details beyond that of, of the tower, you know, zooming in on certain things, stuff. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a lovely, lovely little component of, of this. So um, I'm going to ask you a question before we leave this project and go on to Quick Blocks. Uh, what was the biggest challenge that you had with this? Um, well, let's say in relation to, to Archicad, I mean, I, we don't have to go into, you know, client changing their mind or other things. What was the biggest challenge you had and what, how did you work it out? Let me think about that. Uh, 
uh, as far as ARCHICAD goes. Uh, or, or possibly something that you hadn't done before that you had to figure out. I, I've done a lot of it. I mean, I've been working in ARCHICAD for a long time. So uh, I'm sure there were things I've forgotten. And plus, you know, coming out with new, new versions every year or so, which I have to say, I've, I've got a complaint with auto, uh, with uh, Graphisoft about that. I wish they would come out with once every three years or something, because it's just a difficult to have to relearn a bunch of things every year. Uh, so that's just my complaint. But um, uh, and maybe then just small small changes. Uh, okay. All right. So you know, that's a business question on their side. But all right. So you've, you've, you've uh, I, mean, long I, I don't know. I mean, I think it was. Uh, it was it was just great. I mean, it was easy to, to we would meet and we'd actually talk while when I would actually have them work with them with my working on the computer and we would figure things out. And the, and the woman who was the uh, interior designer, uh, who was uh, uh, she she did a lot of you know chose all the tile and all the finishes and stuff. And we had to work out the bathrooms were a bit of a problem because every bathroom, although it was similar in terms of plans in the bedrooms, she wanted different tiles, patterns for every one, different casework. And I, I did all the casework too as part of the project. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, it's great that you've been able to, uh, well, obviously you've been doing this a long time, so the challenges were just all met in stride um, as you worked through it. and. Uh, uh, just a simple comment if you say, you know, I, I don't like their upgrades every year, you know, I waste time doing that. You can certainly wait a couple of years between upgrading your own, what the version you're using. Um, yeah. So that way you're only having one transition every two years. Yeah, you'll miss something in that second year that you could have done if they have some new features, uh, things like that. But you can do that. There's no problem jumping from 22 to 24 compared to 22 to 23 and then later to 24. Um, but I, I generally find that uh, most of the stuff that you do in 22, you can do in 23, the same. There's nothing you yeah. have to learn, although they improved some of the texture mapping and surfaces. So, hey, that looks actually pretty cool, much better. Um, or you go into 20, um, you know, 24 and, and they have some things about uh, the structural models. Well, if you're not working with a structural uh, engineering firm closely and collaborating on a project, you don't have to learn that. You know, even though it's it's in there. Um, so uh, one of the kind of cool things I found was, you know, just modeling and stuff. Um, if I can find it here, um, I actually created wine bottles that are a whole bunch of them inside the. Um, mm -hmm. I could get inside the tower if you could see them in there. Um, oh, sorry. Um, uh, yeah. So, by the way, um, if, uh, stay right there. Well, um, see, I know you were going to show the wine bottles, but you have a spiral staircase. Is that done with the stair tool? No. So you you did it with just a, a series of individual elements that you rotated and, and elevated. Yeah, because one is I I often find that some of the stair tools don't do quite what I want to do with a stair. It's a little more unusual. Yeah. What, what about the actual, um, the, the normal stair that's going around square sides? Um, no, I did that with, I did that with slabs and, and, and for risers and threads too. Uh, I could have used the stair tool, but, and I, and I understand that, you know, for smaller projects where you're, you're in kind of in a hurry, it, would be, it makes sense. Uh, I do like to, because I, I often do some different things with stairs and stuff, so I, I'd like to have a little more control over the stair. and. Uh, Okay, all right, so that's why you did that. Now I, I'm noticing, you know, you have a nice texture on the wood there. Um, uh, is that a custom texture? Which one? Well, just the the, the vertical boards, um, you know. Yeah, uh, that's a, that was, uh, I think I mentioned it. I actually took a picture of some wood siding. It was maybe on another project of mine and used that as a, uh, I forget how you do it, but you put it in. Okay, so you basically took that picture, made it square, um, and uh, then um, got it cleaned up so that it could 
tile reasonably well? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So one tip, if you want to, can you zoom back out? You might, we might see it from the outside of the tower. Yeah, both, it is both on the inside and the outside of this material. Yeah. So zoom, zoom out where we can see more of the full height of the tower. Okay. You can see those, those lines horizontally, mm -hmm. you know, where, where essentially the, um, the tower texture repeats. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm assuming that's probably not intentional. That's correct. Yeah, it's just uh, it's an artifact. Uh, it's an artifact of the image. Exactly. Okay. So a tip for you, David, as well as um, anyone else who's doing this, when you're working with that texture file, you're first of all you're going to take a picture. Uh, I mean, this is assuming you're taking something from the real world as opposed to a digital file that a manufacturer provides. So you take no, that the real world photo. Yeah, so you take that picture as square on as you can. So in other words, facing the wall, not on an angle. In Photoshop or a similar tool, you're going to crop it and then squ square it up so that it's nice and vertical and you know uh, the edges work. Then in Photoshop, what you can do is you can increase the size of your working area to do two or three times as wide, two or three times as high. And you can use um, there are different options, but you can basically uh, take your sample area so that's sort of the what you've got in your picture and repeat yeah. it side by side and vertically and then you can um go and use various tools to lighten darken or add some more textural variation now at that point if you do it well and usually within just a few minutes you can get something reasonable you'll have a much bigger area that won't look like it's repeating this looks yeah. like it's repeating every, you know, six or eight feet vertically. Yeah. Something going on, and we're seeing certain boards horizontally look like they're repeating. There are two sort of lighter colored boards that look like they repeat every Correct. so often. Yeah. So you can obscure that by basically making a larger field, and then using some digital techniques just to make this a little darker and add a little, you know, other things. And then when you put it on there, it won't look like it's a repeated digital pattern. So that was describing in words. Hopefully, you all can at least have some idea uh, of, you know, what that what might mean. I might create a tutorial about it because it is it is a common question. How do you get something that looks natural when your picture image is, you know, actually a limited size? So, um, so you were going to show something else though, uh, and then I interrupted you. So was there something else in the oh the wine bottles you were talking about? Oh, oh yeah, I'm interested. Kind of because I've used these in other projects too because I often have wine rooms. Uh, having, oops, there, there they are right there. So this is I just created a you know, take, took three a cylinder, a cone, and a thing and put it together. And I think I made it into a library part. I'm mm -hmm. sure. Nope, they're just separate parts now. And that's again, it's uh, when you start to have a whole bunch of it, it starts to kind of make make it hard on the computer. I'm amazed we can we can uh, see the whole half of house without too much waiting on it. I'm, I'm sure it'll be much faster. I'm gonna teach you one thing here. Can you select that cylinder? Um, click on it to select it. This one? No, the big one, let's say. Yeah. Okay, and just open up the settings. There's a resolution setting that you can experiment with. Um, now that looks very smooth at this yeah. scale. And this is probably as close as you would ever get, right? You, you're not gonna be zooming in on this. Um, so if you open up the setting of it, so the uh, library part settings, mm -hmm. as a cylinder, it has structural dimensions. So there's a little pop up there and there's a resolution um, or maybe under 3D representation. Resolution 36, change that to 24. And then just go okay. That really doesn't change much. All right. well, we, we can't even see the difference. You could might be taken down to 18. You could maybe take it down to something like that. Now, think about 24 to 36. That's two thirds as many. But actually, um, you're uh, well. It probably would be two thirds as many polygons. Um, just by reducing those things there, like right. these these bottles. You know, you might have 300 bottles. I don't know how many you have. A lot. But, yeah. yeah you could significantly reduce um, that. And uh, you may find that the, the cork part or the top part of the bottle, that it can go down to 12. 
instead of 36. So then it's one third, because that's as many polygons as the main part. Got you it, know? yeah. Good yeah. point. Um, and you can, of course, select all the ones that are similar and change sure. them all. So you don't have to do them one at a time. Yeah, um, no, I know. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, so uh, that's a, a little tip. So um, we're at the a little over one hour, and we have this whole other section of your presentation, uh, which will be on a modular building system called QuickBlock. So um, was there anything else you wanted to show us in this that we didn't get to? Uh, no, I, th I mean, I, uh, I wasn't sure how far I would go, and I, I, mean, I, I kind of um, highlighted a bunch of different interior elevations or you know whatever, but I think we've probably, we've probably seen enough. I, you know, there's always more we could look at, but if you have this whole other thing to show. There's another comment from uh, Steve Nickel who um, uh, says he's a, he's uh, a, an older guy as well. I mean, so uh, he says uh, you could sketch, you could search sketch up warehouse for a pre-made bottle of wine. If I can do it, David could do it. So uh, you know, he's he's saying he's he's an old guy, not super computer savvy, although he does beautiful work with ArchiCAD. You know, maybe you've seen Steve Nickel. I've, I've, done some tutorials with some of his um, files because he's always asking good questions. So um, anyway, uh, importing a pre-made object like a bottle of wine, you could have even things with uh, labels on them, you know. Um. <laughs> I, 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 I recognize that it's great to be able to make things so realistic. I just, at some point I say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> yeah. You have to use your imagination a little bit too. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, Okay. So anyway, right. okay. we're going to switch gears here to um, to a whole different area. Uh, so you, this is something that's been a passion project that actually could be a viable business and and change the world on some level. Um, tell yeah. us about Quick Clock yeah. and, and how you got the idea, what it's about. I did. I showed you some images of some of the other projects, right? I can't remember if we did. Actually, one quick thing. These are again all in ArchiCAD. Did I show you these? This is uh, this was a, a competition for Guggenheim Helsinki Museum, uh, and I did the whole damn thing and myself. And then this was uh, it was actually uh, World Trade Center uh, for competition back when they did the the memorial. Um, so and all done in Archigan. And then this was a thing what I call a specular gathering place, um, and it had water on the roofs, which was similar to. I, I like to use water in a lot of things you can see there and then uh, so okay so then oh well, actually this, then there's a this was a, a school that was made to be made out of a quick block uh, with roofs walls and and floors uh, and this was for a group that is uh, building schools in Guatemala Ghana and uh, Laos I think um, and I'm trying to convince them to use our QuickBlocks. Anyway, this um, this was a, an old woman who um, is holding a block similar to QuickBlock, but much smaller and much simpler. Uh, and it was actually the guy, one of my partners was involved in this. This was after the Haiti earthquake. Uh, and um, I had, uh, there was a competition to do housing for them. and I. I uh, decided to do the housing competition and I designed a bunch of little houses and I part of the competition was I designed the blocks to go in them. But uh, before that, I'm going to show you uh, this. Uh, I, before the idea for the quick blocks, I had done a small uh, winery, as you can see on the left, it was made of insulated concrete forms, uh, which are ICFs. And I, it was a great, I, I loved it. The owners loved it. The boiler loved it because it went up very fast. I don't know if people are familiar with ICFs are like giant Lego blocks that are styrofoam on two sides and you fill up the inside with concrete. And so it's essentially a form for concrete and you can snap your rebar into it and everything. And after we finished this project, I thought, well, you know, there's so many things you could do better than ICF. Part of it was because you got insulation, about two inches of insulation of styrofoam on both sides. And it, so it isolates the concrete, which is great thermal mass from the inside of the building. And like, if you know, adobe buildings, they keep the temperature very even from uh, high, you know, because they're out in the, the desert. 
but the inside doesn't change much. But the problem with Adobe, besides being not so great structurally, seismically at least, uh, is it also uh, doesn't have insulation generally on the outside. So I figured, well, if you could take the ICF and put all the insulation on the outside, and I came up with this idea, which actually prior to quick blocks was an idea of creating an ICF system with using what's, what I thought at the time was called uh, autoclaved aerated concrete, which is a very lightweight concrete that is, um, uh, it's used a lot in, in, uh, in Europe and Germany and also in the Far East and Japan and stuff. And um, David, it's wonderful second. material. It's fairly light. It has different densities, but it actually can float in water and David. it's insulative and it doesn't burn because it's concrete that has, it's made with, um, by in, uh, putting aluminum powder into the mix of the, with the Portland cement. And hey, that, David. Yep. David, sorry. Can you just change the zoom so it fits the slide in the window in the upper left? You see zoom, it says 196%. Press down in the upper left, that's the, that's the right. And oh, yeah. press down on that and say fit slide, uh, or actually maybe just change it to 300, Two or three hundred percent. Just it should. Okay. Oh, how's that? Better? Yeah. So now we can read the text, possibly. You know. So we're oh, seeing. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I, I'll learn some of these tricks as I go. Uh, yeah. But anyway, so th this was the, the lower ones are what I the idea I went to this thing called the California Clean Tech Open at the time, which is now the Clean Tech Open, uh, was a competition for green building products. And I, the idea was to replace all of the all of the foam insulation with this AAC, autoclaved area concrete. And I I have a, a a rigid foam glass and then an AAC plate layer on the outside. And on the inside, I, I wanted to make two layers, which were like a, almost like a waffle iron. So you could then blow air up through it. So you could take heat out of the wall or put heat into the wall of the concrete. And so you could tune it, and um, it, it would. Uh, I, I actually had it modeled by the people that do the Title 24 energy requirements. And then it was the idea was to make uh, floors, walls, and outside walls uh, all out of this stuff. And the uh, problem is, uh, uh, we didn't win. We can we had a lot of interest in it, but we didn't win. And I was pretty bummed, but I thought, well. Then soon after that, the earthquake occurred in Haiti. So I thought, well, gosh, the problem with places like Haiti, they build with concrete block, but it's very heavy. It's often not properly reinforced and doesn't use the right mortar. And it's also not well engineered. So I thought, well, let's make something that's a lightweight concrete. I was thinking it was AAC at the time, but it turned out I learned it couldn't do that. Uh, and um, so I, this was this was the competition I did for Haiti. This was one of the this was a, a a unit that had a big property around it. It was a duplex, so this this the plan was the same on both sides. And you can see the triangular voids here, which is what that was originally was a 45, 45, 90 degree triangle. And you can see the sections and stuff and all. And uh, we this time I actually did win. For a little while, and then they they ended up they had about 50 winners, and they realized that's not going to work. So they I was unwanted, and but I decided I was going to keep going with the system because I thought it had some great merit to it. So um, that's that was the initial beginnings of Quick Blocks. Um, and going back to this this woman here, you'll see a little later. She, this is how I met one of my partners who was involved with these little blocks and the material. This is made out of cellular lightweight concrete, which is similar to autoclaved area concrete. Big difference is that AAC, autoclaved area concrete, requires a very expensive plant. So you can't have a lot of plants because the, it goes in, you have to put the material into an autoclave, which is a high pressure, high temperature thing, which is very expensive. And But the great thing is when it comes out in 12 hours, it's full strength. Whereas cellular like requires uh, uh, like a 28 day, although it doesn't require that for just being able to demold it. But anyway, it requires time to, for it to uh, come up to its strength. Uh, so 
This, um, and then I, I made this slide here just to kind of show the idea of the fact that building blocks have been around for eons uh, and bricks, especially bricks and stones. And you can make so many things with brick. Um, and uh, and to have architects try have a block that they could work with that could create all kinds of things. And that's what I'm hoping that all the guys who are still hopefully still out there listening might have some ideas of how to build with this. This was uh, this was our this was um, an uh, image of me holding one of the blocks, uh, which was the first ones we cast. Um, I mean, let me go down a little bit. Um, maybe 200. Is that? Um, and you can see it's a, uh, it has teeth on it, and it has it interlocks at the ends, and then you can see these red marks. I think. Can you see those? Yeah. That's where the reinforcing rods go, and they they're um, it's typically a post-tension system that starts at the top or you go drop it down to the footings. It's cast into the footing and cast into a bond beam at the top. Um, these, uh, this one weighs about 35 pounds uh, versus the concrete block here is about the same. So as you can see, you get a lot more bang for your buck. Uh, this, was our, this was our name and our logo. My daughter was the one that came up with the logo. She's pretty good at uh, graphics and things. And then this is a this was what we call a, a, a teaser that doesn't have a result one, one that has a lot of more information in it. So I kind of so you can see all that it's one is it's really fireproof. It's very storm resistant because you can tune it to the uh, how much wind resistance or how much seismic resistance you have. It also doesn't get eaten by termites. It doesn't get eaten by rot or or pests or anything. And it's um, and it's also can be tuned to the environment that it's in. Uh, and we have we have blocks that you can make with floors, walls, and roofs. And uh, so I'll try to go through this pretty quickly, but uh, here you can see the floors, uh, which would just sit on sit on like uh, crushed rock or sand and uh, or a or a, a pour slab. Uh, these are the wall blocks, and there's typically a, there's a corner corner pieces. There actually are uh, four total of four corner pieces. There's this one, this one, uh, a two triangle, and a three triangle. Two triangle, one triangle, two triangle, and three triangle. And that helps to change the angle of the thing. And then we have a typical block, and then one with a flat bottom, which goes down onto a template. And then this is for casting, having a lintel or a um, bond beam. We have ones that are similar for raised floors, which have a beam and a casting thing and then we have we can create like a bent, bent beam or bent um, block which the neat thing about this is you only need one one mold for one diameter and then this is a, a vault by by it was pretty cool by just simply taking one block uh, one of these and cutting it down in the middle right through here and taking a little pie shaped piece out of it and put it back together and it creates this angle is slightly different than the angle on the other side so then can create a vault. Uh, uh, so these are some of the 3D ones that you can I think you maybe I can't see me myself but there's one one back there and uh, these are some one up, the, yeah just go go grab it from behind you. Um, yeah. just bring up the one which holds the whole thing, you know, the group of elements. Actually here's here's the I don't know if you can see can you see that? Well, uh, you'll have to bring it too close to the camera. Okay. You see that? No, no. Bring it in front of you, between you and the computer. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, let's bring it up. Bring it up. Well, I'm hard if I don't. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to show you, though, is All right. it sim simply. Uh, uh, so this is not just. This is a scale model, of course. Yes. Yeah. This is uh, well. This is supposed to be 10 inches from here to here, and it's eight inches from the kind of the midpoint to the midpoint here. And then you can, as you can see, these have these triangular voids, which are equilateral triangles. So, and then the little little round circles, that's where the reinforcing goes. And that's eight inches on center. So uh, once you put one on top of another, it always lines up. I can turn it around. 
it lines up, I can flip it over, it lines up. And that's the difference between this and Lego blocks is Lego blocks have a top and a bottom, these don't. And they and they also interlock from, along the way. So if I took these, which I simply, I just drop them on top, uh, and I'll, you'll see it in a second, and I can lift this whole damn thing up from one end. It just hangs together. It's quite. It's really amazing. Uh, and when we first discovered that, I said, "Holy mackerel, that's a, that's really cool." Um, and so then I, I have one. We want to see it in Archicad and and talk about uh, how you would design with it because it's basically on an eight inch or possibly a, a four inch grid where yes. um, you know you put in your doors or windows you know at a four inch or eight inch mark, <clears throat> um, and so. Uh, that's part of any type of modular system, you know, just how do you accommodate that for your design? Uh, I have a couple little kind of video things. So this is just uh, showing how lightweight this is. It's in water and it floats. Ah, interesting. Uh, this is showing its fire resistance. Uh, this stuff, this is one of my, my partners who's in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, this is goes on for about three minutes. This is at the beginning. We have a sample of cellular lightweight concrete, CLC. It's about an inch thick. He's got his bare hand underneath. It's only one inch thick. The temperature here looks like about 83 and a half degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. There's a question from uh, David Siskalny um, that uh, how do you install electrical and plumbing services? Are you meant to cover the interior walls with sheetrock or cut into the block? Uh, you could cut into the block. Uh, it's actually the material is very. Um, uh, you can cut it with even wood tools. Uh, uh, it's amazing stuff. Uh, but you, but you can also put things in the voids if you want. Uh, smaller like smaller pipes or smaller uh, uh, conduit and stuff. Or you can cut in the block or even fur the wall on the inside and, and you know for big big pipes for um, uh, like plumbing pipes and things. Okay. The the, uh, the material uh, the blocks are meant to always be have a new uh, a uh, both a waterproof membrane and a some type of surface on the outside. <laughs> it could be stucco. It could be um, could be wood. Could be stone, uh, thin stone, thin brick, uh, and it's all easily attached through your membrane into the with uh, metal fasteners into the into the blocks. Um, I, I was going to show you. Sure enough. You can see it's up to about 2,900 degrees Celsius. And then this is, uh, this is about. Is there a, 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 uh, have a website? Uh, you can give us a website address for this? Uh, no, <laughs> we don't. I, I have, we're working on the web, but we don't have a product yet to, to sell. We're, we're, uh, we're still in the startup stage and we're, we got so many things to do, like getting the approvals, uh, you know, ICBO approvals, and a, a lot of things. So uh, we're gonna, what we're gonna try to do first is gonna make some small. Well, one we do is one we wanted to do was a, a small shelter, like for a fire shelter or a storm shelter or even a homeless shelter. Uh, but before that, we would probably do like a fire ring or uh, raised planter beds where we don't have all of the code issues we have to deal with. Um, okay. All right. So, do you have some more slides you want to show before we get yeah, into? This? Just, I'll go through real quick. This is you can see. This is a fire resistance of. Right, this is regular concrete. This is uh, what they call cellular lightweight concrete or foam concrete. And you can vary the density of this stuff. Um, one other thing is it's very soundproof too, or sound resistant. Uh, and you can. Uh, I did this little video here. Getting the sound resistance of CLC, like cellular. But we're not able to hear it well enough. Um, okay. With the anyway, sound generator inside. You can probably barely hear it. And then I'll open it up. Okay. So that's uh, this. Uh, this was a slide showing how the, the 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 blocks would go together in various situations, and then. The, uh, if this is the outside of the wall and this is the inside, 
the outside could be filled up with this blue material, which could be a, a it could be a foam foam uh, like a, a you know plastic foam or or a very very lightweight CLC, which gets you can get an R four of this cellular lightweight concrete. It's it's friable. You have to have it contained, but it is amazing because it doesn't off cast or anything. And then the inner ones could be full strength concrete, or they could even be what's called a phase change material, which basically is very lightweight and, and it absorbs heat or gives off heat by ch simply changing the phase of the material from uh, a liquid to a solid, like a, like wax. That's basically what it, the phase change material is. It's a wax. Um, we, uh, we think that these would be great in places like Puerto Rico, where you could build, you don't have to worry about uh, termites and things eating your buildings up. And also they don't get knocked down by, by seismic things. Uh, we have, they also can be tuned seismically. Now we do have issues as far as seismic right now. The, the, uh, the material really would be an infill similar to um, like a, um, a post and beam system where the posts and beam, posts and beams are actually full strength concrete or steel. And the, this is this would be an infill. Uh, we have met with, uh, let's see, um, oops, sorry. We've met, uh, this is one of my partners. This is uh, Juan Escudero. He's a structural engineer. He's one of my partners. I've worked with him for years. Uh, and this is the man who's in charge of the lab at, at, uh, at UC Berkeley. Who does, they do all the seismic testing and testing of things. And we met with them for, uh, for an whole afternoon. And he told us what we need to do to get various things tested. Um, you can see this is the problem with wood. It gets, it gets it rots or it gets eaten. And, and we don't have any off gassing of the material. Um, we've got the, the different thermal properties of the material. Uh, we believe that our blocks are actually quite green, even though people talk about Portland cement being uh, not such a green product. We were, we uh, are, you, most of our block is air versus Portland cement, uh, and it that makes it much more insulative. Uh, it takes away a lot of this Portland. We can also add some various things like fly ash or pozzolanic material to you know make it more green. Uh, there's a company in New Jersey that is working with a CO2 to cure the, the uh, concrete as well. And one of the things about cool things about this, if we can get get them to let us use it, is uh, with this this technology you can cure the material in a day versus uh, 28 days. Um, uh, other things are there's virtually no waste in this system because we would have we would have an app where you would know exactly how many blocks, what blocks and where they go. And we would then number them in the factory, sh ship them out on pallets in a way that you could disassemble the pallets and assemble the wall like paint by number. And so you'd have almost no cutting of blocks. Uh, and it would be great to have all you architects out there come up with cool designs with these things. Uh, mm -hmm. So a couple of questions here. Uh, Daniela asks, how much per square foot do you estimate it will cost? We actually believe, and I, until we have actually built some small buildings, which part of it is we're, we're raising money in order to get the molds made to make the blocks, but we think we're almost going to be close to wood frame construction. Now, I'm used to wood frame in California where you, there's a lot of steel involved in it. Uh, uh, sister. Um, uh, in other places, you don't have quite as much steel, but you still have it for wind loading and stuff, you know, with clips and various things. So we're not far off from wood. We're definitely less expensive than, certainly than CMU. Uh, we are, I think we're less expensive than, than AAC, SIPS, ICF, even steel frame. Uh, I have some cost analysis, but until we actually have a, a built some new buildings, we can't say for sure. Uh, this right. is a little bit It'll be cost competitive, and so if it's cost competitive, what then would be the main advantage? Is it higher uh, insulation value? Is it faster to construct? Um, what what would be the main advantages? More green? Uh, definitely faster to construct. Uh, no waste. It doesn't burn. In California, I lived through four different wildfires, 
I mean, people, a lot of people lost their homes up in the hills and they, uh, it, it would make, it doesn't make any sense for people to build back in wood, uh, for people building up in the woods, especially in places where you can't get out. If you get stuck and you have, you have to find a place, then we, we've actually created this little shelters you could get into at least till the fire burns through, which is in a couple of hours and then you're safe again. Uh, uh, we think it's, uh, I think it's, uh, we think it would be stronger too. Um, okay. we have the, the steel, the steel was introduced at the ver at the most efficient place. Uh, it's also a, an equilateral triangle and it, we push it out as far as we can to give you the highest moment of inertia for the, for the wall. So, uh, so uh, Steve asks, is the rebar glued in? No, it's, just, it's simply dropped in and it screws in at the bottom. It's not, it's not cast. It's a post tension system. So it's screwed in at the bottom and screwed in at the top and then post tension. Okay, excellent. All right, um, so I wanna make sure we have time to take a look at just, you know, some building designs that you've already. Yeah. Uh, okay, this, is a, this was a little village I created. Basically it's the same floor plan using all the quick blocks. Uh, and then I just created different roofs. So you can have this, this kind of vaulted roof, you have a, a gable roof, you can have single slope one way or single slope the other way. Uh, and the neat thing is that these roofs can be the blocks also so that you could you could run air on the floor, up the walls and up the roof and out. So you can tune the building. Um, uh, so these are, let's see, um, oh, actually here, there's this one. Uh, uh, here, this was, this was a, a twin motion actually. And if I could, I can't figure out how to get the sound on for these things. But, um, and, and I thought it was really pretty amazing. And then this is all these, these were little homeless shelters I designed. Um, that again, it's a little movie going. And I, this was the idea was that each of these would have a different color stucco. And there's four units, uh, four homeless units clustered together. And then there's a, a bathroom space one and a, a kitchen one I can show you. This is this is the this is the cluster of four homeless shelters or or uh, or emergency shelters. You know maybe it's a bunk bed in here or whatever. And then there's a community community kitchen and a community showers, men's and women's best sides. Um, <clears throat> this was this is our original team. Uh, that's me. This is a man who is one of my well, it was actually Howard Backen's client to begin with. You know, he was the one who put up the money for the first patent. We have two patents, by the way. This is the guy in Santa Fe, New Mexico, who has material, who has uh, uh, extensive experience with these materials and also sells AAC and CLC. <clears throat> it's a connection with a German company. This was my one of my good friends who was a landscape architect, a landscape contractor, and had a business in precast. Uh, and then Juan Escudero was a structural engineer. And then we have. Since then, we've, my son has been part of the team and my daughter also, she did the logo and my son's been involved with uh, marketing and stuff. This was, um, I wanted to show this kind of, to start out, I'd show this image here. This was these, this group of people, they, they made, they cast the blocks on site and they built the houses on the same site. And I think that, you could almost do that. We, we have we have actually um, designs for plants, the mobile plants that you could bring in on a truck and cast all your blocks on site or cast them on a site nearby or something. Um, this is, uh, by the way, uh, I sent this to you, um, Eric. If you want, if you wanted to, you could get on my website, which is my my architectural website, and I can uh, you can either you can send you this little teaser. Or I send it to to Eric too, and I'm I'm open to any kind of questions or comments or thoughts or whatever. So I really, as I say, I would love to have you guys and, and girl, girls and guys um, come up with all kinds of ideas of how you could create beautiful buildings with these things. And I'll actually one other thing I wanted to mention, which I didn't mention, is one of the things that's really neat is the fact that this is a thick wall, uh, and what it does is it allows you to make 
really nice window openings and door openings where you could even flare the openings and less so it allows the, the light to shine in. And the other thing, is, which I was reminded of, because of, uh, I when I went to a, um, a kind of a webinar, it was actually a presentation by the guy who does uh, um, rammed earth buildings. And uh, he gave a whole presentation. Rammed earth is a beautiful material, but it's, it's really heavy and it's not very easily reinforced properly. Uh, but he did say something that I struck stuck with me was, one of the amazing things which I showed to that sound resistance, he said, people that build these, these um, rammed earth buildings, one thing they really love is they have great sex in them. I thought, whoa, now that's a selling point. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too offensive to anyone, but it's, it, it, this stuff would really be very, very quiet, very quiet. Right. Okay, so um, uh, I'll invite people to just type in some questions. Uh, but let's take a look in ARCHICAD yeah. at, you know, just a small project because I want to show a couple of things um, before we finish up about modular, um, you know, being able to place things in a for modular component systems. Um, <clears throat> so you want to bring up your um, other ARCHICAD project that just has the, the, uh, the ADU. Um, or potentially I could just bring it up and show um, a couple of things from it. Uh, maybe that's actually better if that's okay. okay. <laughs> I think I've lost it. <laughs> yeah, I, okay. I have it lined up, but I don't know where it is. Um, well, I'll look too, just in case. Okay. All right. So I'm going to make myself presenter here um, so that I can show you a couple of things. So I'm going to show you just uh, what what um, David show sent in, in over to me um, and t teach a couple of things that David wasn't aware of that I think you'll all find useful in a, any sort of modular system. So let me make myself presenter here, um, here. Okay, so you should be seeing, um, tell me, are you seeing my uh, screen with the, the your ADU little house? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. All right, so, you know, the, the um, actual building here, of course, is very, very simple. You know, go to 3D, um, uh, you know, this is uh, what we've got. Um, you know, so it's it, not as simple as it looked like on the floor plan because it does have, you know, um, a second story, etc. there. All right. Well, one of the things that you always need to do is to be able to put the doors and windows at the right places um, so that it fits in. You can see how the end of this window, the two ends, match these lines. <clears throat> now, the way, David, that you have this set up is you actually drew lines. So if I turn off groups um, okay. uh, uh, here, this is simply a line. So David, you just basically drew a bunch of lines or, you know, use the, the multiply command. And in fact, over here, yeah. you can see this is just a grid of lines, purely lines. And then, you know, obviously you can have that off to the side of a building design. You can drop it in and then trim it you know, so you just get rid of the outsides. That's relatively quick <clears throat> and you can hide it and show it based on the, the uh, layer. Um, but uh, for one thing, this is a an eight inch module here. So if I measure, you know, from one intersection to the next, it's eight inch. And you said you can do put things at four inches, right? Yes, uh, yes, that's true. Okay, um, all right. So I'm gonna, uh, and, and it appears from what uh, you told me that this polyline, so this is just a polyline, is the center of the block. And yes. this, actually the distance from here, if I measure from here to this point, this is the eight by eight um, thing. So basically, you know, you're, um, even though the line, you've trimmed it to the inside face um, here, uh, essentially this is the center of your, um, of your design module and the natural divisions are every eight inches, but you could do things at four inch. So how would you, uh, I'm gonna sh just demonstrate something off to the side. If I take um, this wall, so if I just, I drop this wall and I'm drawing um, this off to the side here. All right, so it could be any length and I could type in that I want it to be 12 feet, um, you know, in length. Um, here. So that's not, um, uh, you know, of course, any problem for anybody. But if we want to be able to just sort of move and snap and make sure that it's on a module, it's good to have a grid. 
Now the grid, for those of you who use it, and I know that you said, uh, David, um, you don't use it much and probably in part because you don't understand how easy it is to set up certain things. So what I'll do is I'll just show on the view menu, if I turn on the construction grid display, by default in the US, it's every four feet. Okay, now that's okay. It gives you some sense of scale. It's like graph paper, right? Um, but it doesn't really help you with this type of modular construction. Um, if you um, tell it to snap to the, uh, to the construction grid, then when I'm drawing, it's going to draw it to the nearest four foot section. All right, well, that's okay, except we want to be able to do fine, finer points. So there is a concept in the grid here. So we go to um, uh, grid and editing plane options, grids and backgrounds, uh, where you can say there's a snap grid. So the snap grid is on a, fall, a smaller division, in this case, four inches. Um, so if I say I'd like to snap to the nearest four inch mark, well, now we're getting to the actual module that you're talking about. Um, now, if I say that I'd like to snap to the snap grid rather than the construction grid, now when I'm doing this, you can see it's jumping three foot four, three, uh, three foot eight, four feet, four foot four, four foot eight. Okay, so that's now, um, you know, I'm making sure that it's on a four, four inch module. But where did that start? And like, for example, if I had for some reason needed to place it on this point here because of the way the property was, how do I get that um, grid to be uh, in the right place? You notice there's a tiny little dot that's jumping back and forth. That is my snap grid. That's where, you know, it's allowing me to go. But I can't go to this point here, right? So what, in order to do that, I'm going to um, turn off the grid. So now I can um, go with the wall tool and I can snap, you know, so it's I'm no longer constrained. But what I'll do is I will go and move the origin point of the grid to this corner. By so the way, that, uh, that, uh, that's, that has, that's an extra surface on the outside. The uh, that line, next line in is really the wall itself as far as the, it's a 10 inch thick wall. And so you want to go, there's, a, there's kind of, a, anyway, I, I, I don't okay. think, that's a fine detail here. I want to point out that now if I um, if I turn back on the snap grid and I draw, I can start this wherever I want, like like on that point, and it is going to be snapping to the nearest four inches. So that's the first key that I wanted to point out is that by um, by uh, I'm sorry by uh, using the snap grid, I can have a smaller division, and I can um, set the origin of the snap grid using the origin point. You see this little X. Now, is it is the origin point supposed to be here? Is it supposed to be in the center? Well, probably from your what you were doing, it, it appeared to be the center. So what I'll do is I'll say that I'd like to draw the this to the center. Maybe it's the core center. Maybe it's the center here. I'll do core center. So now, if I'm drawing this, you can see I'm doing it to the center. And as I work down here, it's these nice modules Etc. Um, there. Now that's good because I know that I'm going to be on. Uh, I can start it anywhere I want, uh, even move it around simply by turning off the grid and then using the origin to place it on a convenient point. Um, and I know that I can easily maintain um, a grid spacing. And if I pop in a door or window, so if I go to the window tool and I say I want to pop this in, um, let me just slide this over uh, here you can see that the um, the window is going to be putting in, you know, put in at a certain grid spacing. Now, so that's all good, but we don't have any visual feedback like you had with those lines. And the visual feedback can be good. So under the view menu, grid and editing plane options, first of all, I can make this uh, grid a little bit more visible by changing the grid line color, making it somewhat darker. So now it's a little bit clearer. And we can make it even red, we can make it whatever color. Now we can also change the spacing of the grid. For example, we can say that our main grid is every eight inches, which is what you had. Now you can see here's the preview. I haven't changed it in both directions, so it's asymmetrical, but I'll just do eight inches here. Um, and now um, if we say, okay, we've got your graph paper, you know, basically the same grid is here. 
Now, what if I wanted to make this exactly on your thing? You notice that the um, the lines here, well, they actually are coinciding. It looks it looks pretty darn good. Um, maybe you use the, the project origin as the grid point, but let's just say the one that I had over here is not on that, right? In other words, these, these lines are not passing through the center there. And yet I did move my origin point around uh, with this um, origin. Well, it turns out, let me just turn off the grid snap. We can still leave the grid visible. How would I get these lines to start where I want? That's done instead of using the um, origin point, it's done using the option to make a rotated grid. Now, what is a rotated grid? Well, a rotated grid um, uh, allows you, for example, if I say set rotated grid, I can say I'd like to put it on some ar arbitrary angle. You know, start it here, it goes on 45 or 30 or whatever angle we want. And we can change that at any point by saying I'd like to set the rotated grid. Well, what if we have a rotated grid that is starting at this point here and going either you know, horizontally or vertically? Now, even though it's not technically rotated, or maybe it's rotated 90 degrees or 180 or something, it's on that point. So by using the option to set a uh, set rotated grid and starting it at whatever point we want and orienting it you know, on just the axis is fine, then even though it's technically not rotated or visually not rotated, it is exactly where we want it to be. So a combination <clears throat> of the rotated grid to set the, the, the markers and the origin point here to say, this is my origin. And now everything can be lined up. So if I um, you know, go and place this wall, I'm placing it by the center. Uh, okay, I have to actually, sorry, I have to uh, turn on grid snap again. So I'm pl placing it by the center um, here, and it's every four inches that I have. Turn the corner, you know, and then if I want to pop in a window or door, you know, I'm, I'm popping that in, and I know that it's going to be on one of these division. So that's the trick there. Now the other little thing is um, <clears throat> this is now a um, a visual thing that covers the whole field. <clears throat> We're not going to be able to hide it in the sense of like having it only within the building or not, but we can turn this on or off. So we can go to the view menu. There's um, construction grid display, which has, I've set up a shortcut here of control G that can turn it off. So I can with a key, keystroke turn it on or off when I want to do that. And the way I did that was under the options work environment. Um, uh, I guess it's, if you go into any one of the, oh, keyboard shortcuts is what I wanted, keyboard shortcuts. And in the keyboard shortcuts for my computer, I just, as part of this exercise, I went and I searched for construction, construction grid display. It had no keyboard shortcuts there. I just clicked here and I typed in control G. I, I played around with different things, but you know, obviously G for grid makes sense. And uh, ship, G was taken by something, um, like if I type in G, it says that's used for one thing. Uh, capital G, Shift D is used for another thing here. You know, I ended up, you know, um, Option G, I think, uh, was another one for groups, but uh, Control G was what I, I ended up with or, you know, played around with. So now we can turn this on and off with a keystroke. We can place it where we want visually in terms of the line work. Um, and we can um, get the uh, the actual snaps to the four inch, even though we're using an eight inch graph paper. So does that make sense, um, David, for what you? Yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's terrific. Yeah, so think about it. <clears throat> if you're doing any type of modular unit, like CMU would be a very common one, and you wanna be able to put in your windows or doors at the right lengths, and you wanna have potentially a whole or half brick or block, you know, at the end of the uh, wall, you don't want to unnecessarily have to cut these blocks. Um, that's what the combination of the construction grid, the snap grid, the origin point, and the set rotated grid will give you that control. Eric, so uh, in that file you have there, I can't remember it. It may have added, given you some of the quick block 
library parts is on the lower left or something or they may not be they may be just lines i'm not sure no not um not here oh but actually i did want to all right i had one other thing i wanted to demonstrate <laughs> All right. I was just going to open up this one that I, 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 I pasted in. I pasted in a part of your line work system that showed the block. Oh, okay. This was another thing here. <clears throat> um, so this is th these are this is a polyline. So you this was your diagram that you created as opposed to the actual blocks. Um, right. You created blocks that look like your thing. You know, little scale blocks there, and you can literally place it. Now we, uh, at this point, drawing yeah, drawing um, a wall and popping in doors and windows using those library parts would not be very efficient because you'd have to basically array a bunch of blocks um, horizontally and vertically, and then you'd have to actually cut holes and create a real wall to put the window into because these are objects and you can't put a window into an object. But um, if you want to visualize this, one of the things that you pointed out was, hey, can I get a line that'll look like this, that I can just sort of show how this is modularly done? So I just copied these down here, so just from what you had there. I then trace them with um, lines. So this is a line as opposed to a polyline. Just look at the difference here. This is a polyline. When I exploded it, it stayed as a polyline. When I traced it with the uh, with the magic wand, it, I was able to say draw with lines, and this is an arc as opposed okay. to. Now the reason why I did that is if I if I and then I uh, uh, figured out where you know the um, the actual tangent line is here because you can see here is the center, and I basically by hovering over this I could get um, or with a um, any tool like the uh, line tool, you know, I can hover over this, get that center point, and then draw, um, uh, you know, draw from here and find where it intersects, <clears throat> or you know, other tools to find that point. <clears throat> this is the eight inch on center. Obviously, it's a nice even break here, but here it's sort of arbitrary. Well, I split those elements based on this little dividing line. And why did I do that? I copied all of this stuff and I created a custom line type. So yeah, what does that mean? This is a line. So if I stretch this. That's cool. Okay. Now the problem with the line is that it starts at one end with whatever you've got here. I don't have controls. Um, so, uh, and in fact, actually, if I drag this over a little bit, you can see how you know it starts at that end with this point here, which may or may not be what you want. Um, so another thing that I did was to create a fill. So what is this? This is a filled area. If I go and um, pull this down, you can see it is a fill. Now, if it's just as wide as the actual two triangles, then we'll only see that much. But how do we control the starting point? Well, you see this little line here? If I deselect it, it goes away. But this is the fill is set up with an origin point. And if I move this origin point around, you can see that's where the pattern starts just by dragging it. So of course I could put it on the edge here, I can put it up at a corner, um, et cetera, and of course uh, get this um, in here. And this will also you know, stretch. In other words, if I take the end here, it's just filling this so I can control where I start it and um where's the line i can't start it so, you know so if i put the if i move this in i can you know do whatever i can get it wherever we want um in there so how do you create a custom line and a custom fill and i'm just going to demonstrate that as a closing um thing here uh, i basically created the line work here i selected um so i think i selected uh all of this like that except for this um, except for this, come on now, there. So now I have all of these things that are gonna be repeated. I copied them and I either went into the definition for lines and said I'd like to create a new um, symbol line because this is using 
symbol is, is the type that we're using here. And I'll call this uh, triangle two because I have another one called triangle. And then I paste it in. And when I pasted it in, it said, this is gonna be uh, by default two inches in length and have a gap here like this. Now I'm just gonna use this. You notice it sort of looks odd, it's not connecting. Um, but let's just say, and I make it scale with plan um, here. Now, if I draw with that line, I'm just gonna um, say this line here, I'm just gonna draw, oops, sorry, let's draw it square at least. If I select this line and I say, I wanna make it not with a solid line, but with this new one that I just did, look at how big that is. You can see way too big out of scale. That's because the, the scale, the piece that I did, which was eight inches wide, I have to tell it how big it's gonna to be to scale. And at quarter inch to a foot, it turns out it's 0.1666, you know, it's a sixth of an inch instead of two inches. So I'm gonna go now and just go back to the definition of the line that I just created here and say that I want it to be not two inches, but 0.16667, something like that. See how it gets much tinier. And we don't have a gap. You know, we, we, we're just gonna basically say that it's, they bump into each other. Notice how this, the preview changes. And now here we have our line. So I basically found the unit that was gonna repeat, pasted it into a custom line and then gave it a scale. Eric, let me ask you a question. Could, could you have, instead of done it this way, split it here and say here? Okay, I, I can't see what you're pointing at, David. Oh, I'm sorry. Can I, how do I? Well, just tell me, tell me what you're trying to. Um, <clears throat> oh, well, I, I go and, uh, where you where you got your arcs, the little arcs at the ends. Use the use the uh, the the uh, uh, vertice of that of that arc. Those are on eight inches on center. So, in other words, uh, instead of putting your lines where you got it, you split the triangles where they. I would split it right in the middle of the triangle, and then go down. Two triangles go split the split in the middle of that one too. <laughs> yeah, well, we could adjust this. I basically chose to put. I actually created two versions of the line: one where it starts here, and the other where it, it ends at a nice even uh, place. But you could move this around. Basically, you just want to have have these and split them with the right. unit, like the eight inch uh, on center, um, and then the line will will work. Now, to, to create a custom fill, like I had down here, it's the same thing. I've already cut copy this line work, we go to the options fills, we create a new, see this says triangles quick block, quick block. What I did was I pasted it in um, and just gave it the size, in this case, the real world size, every eight inches um, right. that it would be. Now horizontally is all that really mattered, but vertically, I just wanted to create a gap because these are not eight inches vertically, they're eight inches for repetitions. Um, here. So I just said give it eight inches that way that gave a gap. If I were to make this let's say 10 inches you'll just see that it's going to get further apart. Right. And if we made it five inches or you know five and whatever inches it's going to be overlapping each other right because of the spacing there. So whatever that is. So I just pasted that in um, and scale with plan is important because it's this is real world elements that we're representing as opposed to a graphic that just says uh, it's made of concrete you know, or something like Got that. It. So that's, that's how I created that. And so if we take these, um, uh, this to the actual um, file that you had here, and uh, let's say that I, I take the, um, the fill tool, um, I'm gonna go to the fill tool and we'll just go up here. So if I say that I'm gonna, with the fill tool, I'm gonna create something with the triangles quick block, that's the one I was just showing um, here. And uh, I'll say that it's going to fill in this area. Okay, so it's not filling in the side to side, but I can then go and say I'd like to move. Um, I'd like to rotate this. Uh, actually, I guess uh, if I take this and rotate it 90 degrees, um, and then move this origin point to the edge. Now we've got. Um, you know, the triangles fitting in just the way they, they should be. Um, and you could move this, you know, move the origin point, you know, up to wherever you want 
um, to get that effect here. Now, now we have it square. So uh, this wasn't intended to be the final thing for you, David, although I'll hand it to you to do it. But basically, this now can work. Now, if I take the corner of it up to here, I don't know what you're doing with the corners here and how they would fit. But basically, this at least gives you a, a very quick way of doing um, uh, doing the a graphic that um, would allow you to show when you want to. Yeah. You know. Wait, yeah, my corner end up being like this. Yeah. Um, See, they allow the uh, mesh together like so, and then there's a one for making a <coughs> making like a, a, a jam condition. Yeah. It says well, this is a half height one. Mm -hmm. and they, like okay. that. So yeah, you have to fool around. You know, I think maybe your uh, your uh, fill thing might be work better than the line tool because I don't know, maybe not. Maybe well the, well, the fill tool will allow you to do it. If I go to the line tool and I use the um, the one that I uh, had worked on um, here. So this is the one I worked on last night. Here's the new one. They're probably both much the same. But if I were to draw this line here, um, so I mean, and let me just get rid of this uh, the fill that I had uh, this here. All right. So where does it start? You know, I you know it, it depends on where the line starts. Right. Um, yeah. And so you know, you, it maybe it'll work just fine. But it, it'll start from whichever one was the starting point. In other words, if you go the other direction, it'll start from that side. Um, uh, so that's um, uh, so the line tool or or the fill tool. Um, and you look at this. If I take the if I take your poly line, and I switch it from a dash line here, and I put it into this triangle. Yeah. And let's yeah. get rid of my extra my extra one that I had. Um, uh, all right. Um, so, uh, so this is just right. by making your polyline. Yeah. Um, but you can see it has problems at the corners. It, it, yeah. it, it's trying to, you know, do something, and it, you know, it's not doesn't do what you want. So you could probably mask over that with something. Yeah. Okay. You could cover it with something else that would show what a real corner would be um, there or in your system. But anyway, there, there you have lines and fills that That's are. Great. You know, specifically a symbol representing um, that. Now you can't snap to the triangles. There's no snapping because this is really just a line. This is a line, you know, that um, uh, happens to be bumpy. You know. Um, all right. Let's see if there's any um, questions uh, or comments before we finish up. We're already a little over two hours. Did, um, I, lose, did I lose most of everybody? I'm sure people still there. Yeah. Uh, well, we have, um, what do we have? 75 people still on the line. Um, so Yasek says, is there an ARCHICAD module part that can be used to model this structure? So uh, you did model the those blocks with the slab tool, cutting out holes, then you turn them into a morph to get it more fine-tuned, and then you saved it as uh, an a library part object, and then of course you created variations with it. The morph, um, Yasek, just for your information, everybody else, uh, bog things down. If you were to put in a hundred of those morphs, it would just get absurdly slow. But once it was turned into an object, essentially it's pre-digested, pre-computed, and you could have a hundred of them, and our kids going cool, you know, no problem. Yeah, um, and of course, you can count as well. But putting in a door or window, you can't put in the door or window into a bunch of objects, um, at least not directly. Um, so, uh, so Doug Mirror says also add a floor finish tile grid to visualize rotated grid trim to room. Okay, so yeah, di different grids can be done, but there's no quick way to switch between one grid and another. You can rotate things, you can change the grid, but you saw how I went in and I changed the grid to eight inches. You know, there's no instant way to save that. All right, so Lawrence from Australia says he's got to go and work on a major twin motion project from an architect design project. Okay, a bunch of people saying thanks and they've got to go. And Paul Adams says thanks for the line type and fill tutorial. I never slowed down to figure that out. Okay, all right, and David Siskalny thanks us both. So, um, 
Yasix is how would you model the structure to account for all modules in construction for cost and constructability? So I'm just going to give you the the short answer is you would model it based on the modular spacing, so you know it could be built without any you know extraordinary cutting, um, etc. You can do general quantity calc saying well there's so many square feet of wall and we know that in general this is this many units but in order to get a count of how many of this unit and how many of that um, it would have to be uh, calculated by using an object so that could be the sort of thing where once you've got the design finalized you know they're the pretty close to the cost factor based on just square footage um, and then somebody goes in and just literally repeats a bunch of blocks and make sure that it all fits together and then you can do a quantity report. Does that make sense, uh, David? Yeah, uh, here I just put up a thing. This was uh, an initial cost per square foot of wall. Um, yeah, I'm not, we're not seeing your screen. So oh, uh, uh, okay. is it something that we should switch over? We should finish up because it's already That's after. Okay. That's all right. I can, if anybody wants that, I can send them information. I'm happy to send anything they want. Okay. I'll do. What is your email, best email address, David? J, J as in John, D as in David, Rulon, R U L O N, as in Nancy, at Mac, M A C dot com. And then so you and my, my website is rulonworks.com, www.rulonworks.com. Okay, so JD Ruland at Mac.com or Rulon, RulonWorks.com. Right, okay. one word. All right, so a bunch of uh, thank yous. And uh, um, so Tanya says, is there a class where I can learn how to turn morphs to GDL objects? Where can I find it? Um, so a uh, very brief answer is you model things, one thing like a morph or a bunch of things, you select them all, you go to the file menu and you say save, uh, li libraries and objects save as an object. Um, so that's the simple, quick answer. I do have that as part of the ARCAD training uh, courses that I do. I have um, gone over creating custom objects there. Um, and you can just send me an email if you want a little more help with your question. Um, all right, so a bunch of thanks. David, um, Fascinating work. Um, good luck with the project of getting uh, funding and, and uh, working out the business plan. Obviously, there's a lot of advantages to the system. So you're now at the point of saying, you know, how do we take this to market? So, exactly. yeah. <laughs> and uh, and if there's anyone who wants to partner with David, I'm sure he'd be interested in at least at least yeah. talking about uh, how how you can help each other, or if you want to experiment with how. Uh, a system like this could work on your project if this hits your imagination i'm sure david would be happy to talk to you one thing i mentioned and i would love to find someone who is really good program wise or whatever um to create uh like lego box does have virtual building of legos in the computer we would like to do something similar mm -hmm. so you could actually you uh, the architect or even the, the builder or the homeowner could create the thing in the computer and then they know exactly what pieces how many pieces and or even order them right right and we also make a great toy by the way <laughs> that's true learn architecture through using this block system well david thank you so much for sharing your um, experience and your project and uh, both the architectural project as well as this modular component system so uh thank Thank you very much, Eric. It was, uh, it's been a pleasure working with you over the years, and, and I think your stuff is terrific, and I'm sure everybody else does too. Well, thank you so much. All right, so all of you who joined us today, thanks for joining us. Um, let us know how, wh what questions you have. Um, if you're interested in going deeper into your own Archicad knowledge, uh, check out you know, uh, Barbara.com uh, in general or ArchicadTraining.com where you'll see information about my training courses and coaching program. Um, I'll be back next month with another Arcade user. If you'd like to volunteer, any of you who are watching, either live or recorded, to share your work with other Arcade users, I'd love to you know, talk to you about it. So let me know. Uh, always interested in sharing the work of uh, people who are using Archicad.
This is recorded, Eric? Yes, so it'll be posted on my YouTube channel as well as um, on the ARCHICAD user website. Terrific. All right. All right. Take care. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Thanks.